Welcome to Main Voices Livestream. Before we begin, some messages from our sponsors. Along the river's edge, there's a special place where advanced medicine and compassionate people meet a nurturing environment for healing. The new Northern Light Mercy Hospital, offering more services in one convenient location that's accessible to all because Maine made us devoted to the health of our entire community. The Portland area's trusted choice for senior living, Stroudwater Lodge, gives Maine seniors independence and families peace of mind. Residents enjoy chef-prepared meals, unique programming like beer brewing or classes led by local artists, along with all the maintenance-free benefits of community living. With their sister community, Avita, specializing in memory care on the same campus, Maine families have a wide variety of care options in a beautiful wooded setting, yet minutes from downtown Portland. To learn more, visit StroudwaterLodge.com. And now we'll turn things over to Leslie Bridgers. Good evening, I'm Wesley Bridgers, Features Editor for the Portland Press Herald. Welcome to Maine Voices Live. Tonight, we'll get to know Ayumi Horie, a studio potter in Portland, as she chats with Press Herald arts critic, Jorge Arango. We'd like again to thank our generous sponsors who make this series happen, Stradwater Lodge, Hub Furniture, and our new presenting sponsor, Northern Light Health. And here to say a few words is Mercy Hospital CEO, Charlie Therrien. Good evening, everyone, and, and welcome. Um, as you saw in our video, uh, we're making a lot of efforts to uh, connect with folks in, in greater Portland for their health care needs, but also just as important uh, for us is to make the connections for these types of uh, community events. So uh, it's our privilege on behalf of uh, our, our staff at, at Northern Light Mercy Hospital to uh, support uh, Portland Press Herald to sponsor this event tonight. I look very much uh, look forward to a great evening. Thank you very much. And now we'd like to welcome to our virtual stage, Ayumi and Jorge. Thanks, Leslie. Hi, Ayumi. Hi. Thank you, Leslie. How are you doing, Ayumi? Nice to see you again. I'm well. How are you? Very, very well. Good. Thought it was a heat wave today up here <laughs> compared to what it's been. Yeah. So, um, so we had a really interesting meeting the other day and conversation. There were lots of fascinating things that came up. We're probably not gonna be able to cover them all, but um, why don't we just start with a little background so people can get to know you a little bit who don't know you. Um, so just tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Lewiston, Auburn um, as a Japanese or in a Japanese immigrant family. And we're gonna be having, by the way, as, as Yumi and I are talking, we're gonna have some videos going that show her working. So yeah, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, well, uh, needless to say, uh, there was there weren't very many Japanese in Lewis and Auburn in the in the seventies and eighties. Um, so I grew up in an extended family. My grandmother lived with us. My Japanese grandmother, aunts and uncles, cousins. Uh, my mother was the only one uh, in the family who was white. Um, and at home we spoke Japanese and um, it was it was really the age of assimilation, right? You, you kind of kept your head down and tried to fit in. And I think we were lucky in the sense that um, I think there are a lot of immigrant families before us, uh, there was a real pressure to speak English at home. But in our house, we spoke Japanese and we really, uh, my family really tried to keep traditions and, and rituals alive. So um, I think it's interesting in the sense that I think often for immigrants, there's a um, kind of way that culture is either fr like frozen or preserved in time from when they left their country of, of origin. Um, so for example, the Japanese that I learned from my grandmother was really a Japanese that was, um, in a lot of ways kind of antiquated, you know, it was like 50 years old, it was a kind of provincial language. 
So I think that like, as I've grown up, I've, I've come to kind of realize how special that is. And I think that there is a way in which um, when I was growing up, I was always kind of wrestling with um, thinking about things kind of dualistically. Uh, and now I, you know, I recently have learned about this movement that was started by Japanese mothers who had biracial kids. And it's a movement called um, double or daboru. So instead of feeling like you're half this and half that, you actually have twice the culture. And I think for me, it's been this like real gift to um, start to think about my childhood that way and start to think about how, um, how rich my life has been because I've had like multiple cultures. Were you treated in, in you know, well in Lewis and Auburn, or were you really treated as somebody who was an outsider? Did you feel like an outsider? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any way around that. I mean, I, I, you know, always felt like I had to um, kind of walk, you know, be the kind of, I mean, it was, it was the, also the age of being a mo kind of model minority, right? It was really kind of watching your behavior, being as polite as you could be. And, and there was a sense that you were in a lot of ways, a kind of ambassador to, you know, not just like every Japanese out there, but um, every other kind of uh, Asian individual. And so um, I think that that pressure was, um, was difficult, but it was also like not named, you know, it wasn't um, clear at, at all to me growing up, like what, um, what that tension was. And oh, no, I think and you were know, actually, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say that, like, I think that in a lot of ways, um, my family, I mean, I think that when people often talk about immigrant culture, they focus on building a new life. And I think that my family did that in a lot of ways. Like I, food was really kind of central to my childhood. We always had a garden, did a lot of fishing. Um, there was, you know, there were seeds that were sent from Japan um, so that we could, uh, you know, grow Japanese vegetables that weren't available um, in grocery store, right? Like grocery stores like kabocha or daikon. Those are vegetables that you actually see in supermarkets these days. And we also did a lot of foraging, warabi or um, fiddlehead ferns. That was something that you, they would pickle in Japan and, and they found them here in Maine too, or horsetails as well. And so I feel like that for me was, um, that was a, a, a way to connect and continues to be a way that I connect with my childhood and my past. Sure. Well, and you were also uh, sort of an outsider in other ways too. I mean, just being an artist for one thing or someone who is in the creative fields um, is not everyone's story. So do you, did you feel that level of sort of being outside too or was that kind of cool for you? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, I guess I embrace that, that, um, as a as a kid to to a degree in high school, but I don't think that I really got into it until um, after college. I mean, that's when I really got interested in ceramics. I mean, I think the other thing that was um, difficult, at least for me, growing up in Lewis and Auburn or in Maine, was um, growing up gay. You know, it was like that was like absolutely like something that wasn't talked about at all and and also like a thing that I couldn't put my finger on or name like I didn't know any gay people at all and so um when I think about like how much has changed since then it just feels like a kind of an, an amazing thing it's not to say that there isn't still work to be done um but it it is definitely uh something that's you know easier for me here and yet uh, when we go back to Japan as a gay family, it is not uh, heard of. I mean, of course there are gay people in Japan, 
but um, queer parents are are an anomaly, and and so I feel like I'm sort of between a lot of worlds in that sense. So yeah, you have a wife and you have two, well, you have one child and one on the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Good luck. Um, so you have this really rich Japanese cultural experience at home. And then you, when did you decide to be a potter? And when did that sort of start to manifest? And also how, how did, was there something about pottery that or Japanese culture that informed your decision to study pottery? Did you like Japanese ceramics, for example, or were inspired by them? Yeah, I mean, I think that I was attracted to a kind of lifestyle that it um, that I idealized in some sense in my head. Um, you know, and there's a famous uh, potter named Shoji Hamada who um, embodied that for me. I think there's all kinds of stuff that I didn't understand, like fully comprehend or understand, like the kind of division of labor that was involved in his studio. But growing up in Maine, I feel like there were a lot of um, examples of craftspeople out there making it as a, as a living. And so the kind of self-sufficiency of being an independent maker was attractive to me. And I think as also as a family, we were really self-sufficient also. Um, but I also think that pottery is really, you know, it's, of course it's central to domestic life and I'm drawn to function as meaning really. And by definition, I think something functional has a purpose and has a place in, in the house. So I think it was like, partly it was like a, an affinity to the material, the kind of squishiness of the material, the, um, the process, like all the different steps involved in making pottery. And then of course, like the end product also, the way this, um, the way that like objects of domestic use like that infiltrate our lives, you know, like a third of our, I heard this statistic once, a third of our time spent not um, working or sleeping is spent in um, either making meals or eating. So I feel it's like there's a way in which pottery can send a message or um, create a space for learning. Right, and you're, uh, so you mentioned the lifestyle, the self-sufficient lifestyle, but you also talk a lot in the videos about the process um, and the product that you make, um, both sort of forcing people to slow down, which is a really interesting concept and I can completely see it, but then you were also one of the first people, one of the first crafts people to sell your work solely through your website, which was technologically pretty advanced. So there, there's two, there are two sides of that that I think are really interesting. It's like you, you have a, a balanced view there, which I find cool. Yeah, I mean, um... I, I did a series of pots uh, that I'm sort of riffing off of now, but they were white decals on porcelain pots. So they're images that were um, basically invisible if you were a couple feet away from them, but as you got closer to it, and of course, as you rotated it in your hand, you could see that image. And so there's a way in which like you couldn't understand that thing unless you were holding it. And of course, the haptic is like critical to, um, you know, making something like pottery, which you hold in your hands. It's like this like incredibly intimate object that you bring to your lips and needs to fit in your hands and kind of negotiate like the, the hotness or the coldness of whatever you're eating or drinking. And how you, um, so there's that, and then there's the sort of online life, which I think in a lot of ways uh, works for, I would probably call myself an introvert. And so, um, so yeah, I, I've really made my whole living off of um, investing on a kind of online community really early on. I mean, I coded my first website 20 years ago and then started selling online shortly after at a time where people 
felt like, how do you even buy a cup when you can't feel it first? But like, as we know, it, it feels like everything has sort of moved online, which for better or worse is, is kind of the way it is. But, you know, my relationship with my online life has kind of, in a lot of ways, come full circle in a way. Like I've embraced it. I've pulled away from it. I've, um, you know, and I'm, I've used it as, um, of course, a kind of tool for aesthetic ex expression and a way to uh, manage a small business. I mean, you kind of can't um, have a small business, I think, these days without using the internet in some way. So let's talk about the work itself. And we have some pictures here. Um, Strawberry, you just had one up. Um, why don't we start talking um, a little bit about how um, Japanese culture informs the actual work and and then talk a little bit about this concept of um i'm gonna say it wrong kawaii kawaii yeah you said it right oh yeah, yeah. i surprised myself good yeah so you um we have images up here why don't you we just scroll through them and, and talk about them a little bit well when i was first in school it felt like a real battle to talk about um this I mean, in Japanese culture, this is a, a concept that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and it's the kind of concept of cuteness. And the way that I is manifested for me in my work is that I want this work to engender a kind of softness in people. Um, and I mean, I think for the, the the kind of majority of my work is influenced by Japanese aesthetics, but I also, I wanna sort of sh give a shout out to my mother who, who's an anesthesiologist. And when I was a kid, I asked her like why she chose that instead of uh, something else. And she, she said it was because she didn't wanna see people in pain. And that really struck a chord with me it, and I, it stuck with me. And I thought, oh, it's like, how do you, I mean, we all want, I think, to make meaningful work in our life. And for me, it's like the idea of making objects that are can provide some kind of psychological comfort uh, is really the, the main aim of the work is to, um, it's not, I, I, I have a whole kind of activist side that ch is challenging um, and is wanting to disrupt systems. But I think for the work itself, like I want to create um, a kind of uh, safe and soft space for people to um, maybe, maybe it's like a restorative space where they can do this other work outside, um, but the pots themselves are about comfort. Well, and it's, so the kawaii that you're talking about, this culture of cuteness is, you say it's hundreds of years old and it's huge still. I mean, it's it's what I think informs and correct me if I'm wrong, but manga, for example, and a lot of like to Tom, um, uh, who is it? Um, Murakami, mm -hmm. Murakami's work with all those big fields of daisies and smiley faces and things like that, right? But for you, um, it's really, you've developed this concept of relational aesthetics, which I find very fascinating, which you kind of started to touch upon. Can you, can you speak about relational aesthetics and what that means in regards to your work? Yeah, let me just back up a second. I think um, there's a lot about kawaii culture that I also, um, find problematic. So for instance, Hello Kitty doesn't have a mouth. I mean, there's a way in which she's silent. Um, and I think as a feminist, I uh, find that problematic. And so a lot of my characters, um, you know, have a little bit of a fierceness to them or they have a lot of teeth, right? There's like, a, there's a way in which I want them to be themselves, be able to have a voice. Um, and so when it comes to relational aesthetics, I feel like, you know, it's this, it's this catch word that the art world adopted to talk about, um, 
work that hinges on social relationships or on commun communal bonds or communities that, you know, art that moves like beyond a private sphere of art making. Um, and I think, I feel like pottery has been doing that for thousands of years, like truly, like these are objects that are meant to be shared, that are tacti tactile objects that live in relationship um, to each other and then to people in the family. And uh, as I was saying before, the kind of intimacy of, of handling these objects, I mean, that doesn't happen with paintings. So I want, I think, uh, to emphasize like how, um, yeah, just how critical it is to, at least for me to have like beautiful objects in my world that I can interact with and the kind of power of them. So like, for instance, like this is a match striker. I mean, this is really something that I developed um, for culture, like cult, cultures in a cold climate, right? It's like, there's a kind of ritual, at least in Maine, of making a fire in the morning if you have a wood stove and a lot of people have wood stoves. So like, there's, um, I like the idea of moving beyond uh, food in terms of function. So like, how are all the other ways that ceramics can function uh, through an object? So match strikers are one of those things. And I really love this kind of, um, you know, it's like the days are getting longer now and, um, and, but we still are, you know, it's still dark right now. And so this kind of culture of light, I think is like, there's something really beautiful about. So like, how does ceramics fit into that? Which so that, that particular character had like this big schnoz and was really kind of adorable. And then it's got the fang. So that's, well, that's what you're talking about. Like having the, the cute and the fierce sort of coexisting in the same creature, right? Yeah, yeah. I actually, I think that's a good segue into this idea of um, animating inan inanimate objects. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, so in, like in, in Japan, there is this like, I mean, I don't think it's widespread now, but there's a superstition about tools or objects being possessed by a spirit and coming to life. And they're these kind of troublemakers. And so, um, a couple of years ago, I created uh, Membachi Bozu, which is this noodle bowl boy. So um, here it is on a on a tenugui, which are I've been making these Japanese um, hand towels tenugui. So this is like a um, this is a, a ramen bowl who comes into the studio at night and um, warps pots and breaks them and like generally creates havoc. Um, and I think that there's something like really nice about um, this kind of magical thinking. My wife's an art teacher, and so she's been doing some lessons around yokai. And I think one thing it does is it it kind of it makes your environment alive, right? And it gets pe kids or anybody really to think outside their point of view. So, like, what would you do if you were a a, a noodle bowl and you wanted to cause trouble? you know, um, and also just to think about the role of myth and folklore in, in our lives. At the same time, I feel like I'm, you know, pro-science, pro-vaccine, pro-mask. And so um, I've been making these, um, I've been making- Oh, cool. Yeah. Syringe, like golden syringes and um, masked animals. I mean, it's a really, I mean, in some ways it's a way to cope with a pandemic. I mean, I'm absolutely not making fun of anybody. I mean, this is, there's an unbelievable amount of pain and suffering happening right now, but I wanna support frontline workers, you know? And um, so, yeah, I think it's just a way of coping with the stress in a way. And for these things, cup, how cups can be talismans, in some ways, how they can support people, uh, just with a you know a cup of coffee in the morning. Well, they can also teach people. I mean, you had you had talked about um, your alphabet mugs, which we had up just a second ago. But if you don't mind putting it up against strawberry, that would be great to see. So here you you've got the alphabet on 
this adorable little creature. Um, and so the so what does that do? Like, how did that arise, that design? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I mean, I think that any potter is going to be comfortable working within parameters in a way. And I think often the best work is made when there are limitations. Um, and so it's the same with the alphabet, like, right? Like or the Roman alphabet where there's like a set 26 letters. But then within that, it feels like there's a lot of um, movement that can happen. And I think I've always like loved the idea of function kind of moving beyond physical function that um, that there are objects that are didactic. So the idea of uh, your kid learning their, their letters not from, or maybe on top of paper or books, um, that they're learning them from clay pots or from cotton towels uh, is just a really like lovely idea so that there's a whole family of objects in your house that support that learning. And I've also been working with multiplication tables for a long time. And I've just come out with, so I've been working on these. You see that? That's one of the Tenegui. This is the one of the Tenegui. So it's like, there's math in your kitchen and math in your bathroom. And um, yeah. I, I think that, um, yeah. So, so there's, I mean, what's interesting about that and this kind of feeds into the whole discussion about action, um, social action, activism. So the, the pots, I mean, you're, all, you're talking about many levels of it, these relational aesthetics, the cultural, sort of messaging that comes through them too, and cultural embodiment, the fun in it, the, but also the teaching aspect of it. So you're working at many levels on all of these, and then you have a whole body of what you do that is activist, right? So like the uh, Ostracons and other things, do you wanna talk a little bit about those um, and then talk a little bit about the artist's role as an activist in the world. Yeah, I mean, I think I came to it reluctantly, um, but I think that at some point I realized that there were kind of limitations um, within how I wanted to make ceramic work. I mean, there are plenty of people like um, dealing with political imagery uh, and content in their ceramic work, but at, at that's not where I want to go with my ceramic stuff. I'm way more interested in using, um, I mean, it's been shifted over the years, right? So the first thing I did, I think that was really political was Obamaware in 2008, uh, which was this fundraiser and um, strawberry, I don't know if you can get that one up. Yeah, so Photoshop, everybody. Um, but it was a fundraiser in which I, it all happened within five weeks. And I asked, I was basically the curator, asked a bunch of people to make Obama themed work, um, which we then sold at auction and, and donated the proceeds to uh, his campaign. And then in 2011, and that was really the kind of first craft fundraiser of its kind online. Um, and then in 2011, I organized Handmade for Japan with a couple friends, Catherine Manzella and Ai Kanazawa. And, you know, the, that, the big earthquake and um, tsunami had happened in Japan. Um, and we pulled all these artists together and again had an auction and raised $100,000 for disaster relief. And I really thought of activism in terms of fundraising for a long time. Um, and then I, I it ventured into other stuff, right? So then I did, um, well, like Portland Brick is is a project that maybe we can touch on a little bit. So this is a is a collaborative it's not political, but it's actually it is raising social awareness about a neighborhood, and it's actually improving a neighborhood. So yeah, talk a little bit about Portland Brick. This is great. Yeah, and the aim was really to kind of. Um, center different narratives, right? It's like we have, we're live in a city with a lot of public monuments to like famous dead white men. 
And so it's like a kind of revisionist history where we're looking at um, like what is important uh, about like everyday movements or everyday people. So this is a project that, um, that I did with Elise Peppel who was a storyteller. And we made uh, 30, we took 30 um, phrases. So some of them were historical facts, uh, some of them were contemporary stories and some of them were future wishes um, in the India Street neighborhood of Portland. And so um, they all started with a date on this spot in whatever date it was, or it, it could even be like, the, there's one in front of Macucci's, it's on the spot uh, every Christmas. Uh, I can't remember how it goes. Friends and family gather at Macucci's, something like that. This was a future wish. Um, and it's aspirational, right? But it's like, it makes you think like, is this actually really gonna happen? I mean, it's something to um, aspire to and we want we want to have happen, but um, like how, how could this happen uh, collectively? So, you know, there also, there's also a way in which this project was this kind of anti-monumental monument. They're, they're really, kind of camouflage in the sidewalk. You have to be looking for them in a way. I mean, it feels like you're finding a $20 bill when you find them, but it's a really like kind of beautiful uh, interruption of a walk, I think. And in a lot of ways, I was think, thinking about it as a kind of framework in which something else can happen. Neighbors can meet over the brick and have a conversation or you know, tourists can come and learn something about um, the city that's like a little bit um, offbeat and in a lot of ways feels more real. I think pots work in this in a similar way where they create a framework in which or like a theater in which like all this a family has a meal together. So I think so so go, ahead. go ahead, sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, so yeah, so you've got Portland brick. Um, and then you have, I mean, that's a beautiful project. And then you have some that are a little more acerbic. Do you want to talk about the astrakhan's a little bit? Yeah. I mean, that was just kind of a snarky um, uh, response to the, the latest um, uh, presidential election. Strawberry, can you get that one up? So in ancient, just to get, I, I'm... I've done a lot of projects about like quirky uh, ceramic factoids. One of them is that in ancient Greece, um, you could scribble the name, scratch in the name of somebody you wanted to ostracize onto a pottery shard, an unfired pottery shard. So here are mine for Donald Trump. And so in ancient Greece, you'd they'd throw them into a pile. And if they got like a certain number, say like they got 6,000 votes for, you know, um, Johnny getting ostracized, that person would get ostracized for 10 years. So I thought, oh, like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do that with, with some of our politicians? So here's one for Donald Trump, but it's actually, um, it works on multiple levels. I mean, just in case you don't have a pottery shard lying around that you could scratch his name into, this is a PDF that you could print out and um, crumple up into a ball and then throw at your, you know, TV screen or computer screen and it works the same way we know it works because it worked Great. but i think oh. most recently i'm looking at the time also i mean most recently i i have felt like um the kind of most effective way to make change is to um serve on boards. I've been, I've served on boards for almost 20 years. And right now I'm the president of um, Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. And, you know, I think like when, when I think back to like my, my mother, um, you know, talking about wanting to not see people in pain, I, I think my, my, the next iteration of my thought is like, how do you mitigate harm? So it's one thing to make pots that like comfort people. And then it's like, how do we create cultures and systems where harm doesn't happen in the first place? So, you know, in craft, um, space, spaces of making and teaching have, have really been very white spaces. Um, 
and they've they were you know created for the most part um, in the wake of World War II, where um, male artists came back from the war, went to school on a GI bill that excluded women and people of color, and then set up departments in university and brought this kind of military hazing culture with them into art education. And I think it's, you know, as warm a community as craft is, it is also done a kind of immeasurable amount of harm to generations of artists. And that's all coming out now. And so I'm wondering, you know, how do we address the past, right? Like, how do we go back and um, figure out who's been erased from our craft histories? How do we add information to uh, icons that have um, had really problematic pasts? Um, and how do we professionalize craft organizations so that we have policies to support the kind of cultural shifts we need to make so that these spaces are more equitable and inclusive? So um, I feel like that is for me like really critical work at, at this juncture in my career. And you're practicing or you're you're trying to affect that sort of change on the haystack board and on other boards. Are you on other boards that that deal with that? Not right now, but but I, I mean, you know, it's a question of. I don't know. You know, when I was growing up, I was a, a, a unbelievably shy kid, unbelievably shy. And so I feel like it's taken years and years of work for me but to be able to find my voice and to um, also just like figure out what my own kind of identity is right it's like we never talked about this stuff uh, you know in my family or societally as as we were growing up and you know I have my wife Chloe is like uh, this kind of amazing support system for me and an amazing kind of thinker around um, how we start to um, shift things and how we live um, authentically, like whether it's, um, you know, just sort of speaking our truth or how we think about culture even. I mean, we have this little kid who um, I speak Japanese to and we cook Japanese food um, sometimes it's like, how does culture get passed down from generation to generation? I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but how does, how does culture get um, passed down from generation to generation? And how do we think about um, the things that hold us back, right? It's like culture. I mean, one thing that Chloe always talks about is like how culture is always changing. It's not like um, a, a, a thing that gets um not static. It's, really, it's not static and like in Japan it's like stuff is changing all the time there and whereas here it's like I know what I learned from my family but you know what is that um what are the what are the kind of traditions and rituals that I pass down to our kid you know that so that she'll have a kind of um you know, there's a, we were talking about kawaii as a kind of cultural concept. Another concept that I feel like is, is that I try to inject into my work is natsukashi, which is a kind of um, remembrance of uh, a fond memory. It's, it's a really kind of positive, it's, it's a longing it's a, there's a bitter sweetness to it because you can't go back there, but it's also like a really positive poignant thing. And so when I think about like my family, um, you know, what was Natsukashi for them and what, like, what are the kind of experiences that we can create for, uh, for, our, for our kids that will, that are that kind of Natsukashi feeling? I mean, I think like, like that is like a, really kind of beautiful thing that um, you can pass on. Great. So before we move to questions, because we're getting to that time where we're going to be doing that, um, where can people 
well, let's talk. Let's first talk about what's coming up. If there's anything interesting, I know on Thursday night you have a, a panel discussion at Bates happening, Bates College. Yeah, that'll that's a more of a ceramics based discussion, but um, maybe Strawberry can put the link into the chat or something for the Bates College lecture. Yep, so that's then, Thursday at seven. And then I have a sale coming up on February 8th online. Um, and I've, for a long time now, my I basically don't make enough stuff. Um, and so the work sells very quickly. And um, so I started doing this thing called the Pottery Lottery. And some people have been trying to get work for like 10 years, which is kind of ridiculous. And so it's a lottery system where there's not such a kind of frenzy. There'll be a general sale, but I also want to open it up and try to try to make sales more equitable, um, at least in terms of access. It doesn't solve the pricing issue, which I admit is another issue, but uh, people can sign up for my mailing list. That's probably the best thing. And then they can get into the pottery lottery that way. So, and you're what you want to tell people what your website is because you're not sold through craft shows or retail, right? It's just solely through online, right? Yeah, uh, once in a while, I'll do like a limited edition with um, some place. Like I sell uh, sometimes with Entoten, uh, E N T O T E N um, S D, San Diego. Um, she she was actually a partner of mine on the Handmade for Japan project, and she imports crafts from Japan and then also carries some American uh, makers also. But yeah, I don't really, I mean, that, that was a kind of decision, business decision I made a long time ago is to just focus on uh, online sales. It, it was, I mean, talk about relational. I feel like um, when you sell wholesale, at least for me, it felt like I was just selling into a black hole. Like I had no idea who was buying my work. And I think that when you sell online, you're able to have a relationship with people who buy the work. And there's something just really lovely about that, I think. So it's ayumihorie.com? Yep. Okay, great. So we can maybe put that in the chat too. And um, so why don't we, we have some questions that are coming in and since we were talking about kids and hope, um, I like these two questions here. One is from um, LD, um, who is almost six years old and a budding artist. And she asks, who helped you learn about art when you grew up in Lewis Lewiston? Oh, my grandmother. Um, probably not a great resource now, but uh, I think I had a family that was uh, really supportive of it. I mean, I guess I would say that like, that's a gift that you can give your kid is to, you know, one thing I love about my wife is that <clears throat> the, there's no kind of right or wrong way to do something. I mean, I mean, there, there's some things that like, you have to do one thing before you do the next thing. It's just the process question. But I think when she gives an assignment, like the kids come out with like a million different um, versions that are kind of true to themselves. They're not like cookie cutter, cutter um, solutions to, to a question. And so I think that that is like a way to encourage creativity and to create, uh, encourage problem solving. I mean, that's so much of what art is, is problem solving. I mean, um, you know, you have an expression that you want to express, uh, and you have to figure out how to do that effectively. Great. So, um, uh, Sandy Banks wants to know what you have on the wall behind you. It's a cool backdrop for your Zoom. Yeah. Well, let's see. It's a, they're all, um, they're tiles, they're, uh, they're like uh, decal samples and luster samples and um, like really uh, fast sketches. They're all birds, but uh, playing with slips, colors, um, material. 
copper does this cool thing where it leaves a halo around luster. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so it's just always something I'm working on. I have another one over there, which you can't see, but it also like color, color samples, com combinations. Your glazes, right? Here's how they operate on the kiln, how they function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yep. So we had another question here, um, which relates to sort of what you were talking about before of, you know, working and sometimes make good pots, sometimes they make not so good pots. So there's somebody who is asking, um, who's on anonymous, who wants to know how the concept of wabi-sabi, if it enters into your work as an artist, uh, as a community activist. Oh, and well, it definitely, I mean, so those of you who don't know, I mean, to in a nutshell, wabi-sabi wabi is, is um, kind of the beauty of imperfection. I, I think it's hugely important to the ceramic work. Um, it, I mean, I think that for me, I mean, it would drive you, I mean, there's some ceramic, is, ceramics is kind of a chameleon, right? It sort of like fits whatever your personality is. Like personally, I feel like when there are accidents that are not so great, but uh, oftentimes there's like, accidents or ways to set up a process in which it isn't perfect. So this process called dry throwing, which um, I started when I was in undergraduate school where I throw pots without water. It's basically like a trimming technique where I'll scoop out the inside and I'll, I'll thin the walls by pushing them out. Um, that's a process that's like, it is the, the kind of whole aim is for it to be imperfect. Um, and I think that to me, like the most, the, the work that I love best is work that, um, that something has kind of gone wrong either intentionally or unintentionally. And that I love that kind of looseness as well. I mean, I like, um, I don't know, I like using like a wide rib mark and it gives you the kind of like a slow, easy feeling to the, uh, to the wall of a cup. I mean, these like small details really matter. I think that's a really good question about the activism. And I think I would say that um, all of us are, you know, especially when it comes to equity work or social justice work, I think we all are where we are at and none of us are perfect. It's like, we're all learning stuff all the time. And I, and I think that we have to, um, you know, cut each other some slack. And also maybe the most important concept for me in regards to that kind of work is, is cultural humility or just humility in general is uh, admitting what you don't know and um, listening to others who might've had different life experiences than you have. I always tell people humility is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So since we're talking about process, there's a fun question here from Jennifer Dow, who says, you have a lot of videos on your site of, uh, of you squishing and squashing unfired pots, which for a non-potter seems a bit horrifying. <laughs> Can you talk about that a little bit? Is it a natural part of the process or an anti-preciousness about the form and material or something else? Well, I mean, I think that there is a lesson um, in not, um, you know, not making something too precious. There's, I mean, there's a, you know, one thing that's happened in the last 10 years is that uh, the internet and video in particular, video on Instagram in particular, I think it's opened up a whole huge audience um, to ceramics and what, what they learn when they, I think, when they actually make it into a studio and start to take classes is that there's, there's, a, there's a steep learning curve that the practice and practice and practice it takes to actually be able to throw uh, is immense. And so I think uh, preciousness works against skill building in that sense. And I think it makes way more sense to throw something and squish it and throw something and squish it uh, in the beginning until you start to like uh, find whatever pattern is your voice. Um, I, 
you know, I have this hydraulic press, I have this ram press that, uh, you know, you can press out plates or bowls or whatever it is, but if you don't put those molds on it, I've been using it to um, uh, press out bowls and then squish them and then squish them with two by fours to make a plate. Like, I just like that idea of uh, pushing function, how you make a three-dimensional thing, like flatten it more into a two-dimensional thing, which can still work for a lot of foods. Like I was thinking about them as kind of sushi platters uh, but there's something really nice about also handling an object that it's it's a bit of a liability, but handling an object that is sharp or is hard to clean or whatever it is, it's like it puts a different kind of um, onus on the user, which I think is interesting. And I think it's just like materiality. I mean, that's uh, what drew me to ceramics in the first place is the, the kind of ASMR quality of it, which we didn't even like know that that was a thing when way back when, you know? What is ASMR? Oh. For people who might not know. Somebody helped me out. I can't remember what it stands for, but basically it's like a, uh, you're like entranced with this kind of um, the materiality of something. Like you'll see these material, these materially based like oozy videos on Instagram like it's something oozing or they're cutting or they're shaving something or whatever it is it's like all that stuff exists in ceramics and always has autonomous sensory sorry meridian what was it response tingling sensation that typically begins on the scalp and moves down the back of the neck and upper spine I don't have it personally but I I, a lot, some, some people do. And, um, yeah, there's, you know, and I mean, I think for me, I've done a lot of, I've, I've gotten really interested in video work as a way to kind of share all the beautiful moments of the process of making, uh, that aren't necessarily evident in the final product. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I love that you can go to your site and see all of there's so many videos on there and all of them are really interesting. I really encourage people to go and see them because it they handle different things. My favorite one so far is the ramen making one, but there are lots of really interesting videos there. And you talk a lot about your work and the process of the work. And it's really because we only have an hour for, for this discussion, but really there's so much that's covered in those videos. Yeah. And um I mean, the ramen making one, it's like, I do want to make this link for people between food and clay. I mean, it could be other materials also, but it's like, I think for me, it's like a way of um, encouraging people to embrace um, their creativity on like multiple levels, you know, whether it's like renovating your house and like figuring out like what kind of fixture you like or attracted to or what kind of newel posts you want or whatever it is. It's like, I think there's a way in which our aesthetics uh, um, kind of transcend medium. And, you know, whether it's like us picking out our clothes or whatever it is, it's like we live aesthetic lives. And so um, exploring that in whatever way makes sense for people. So we have time for probably about two more questions. So, um, uh, Amy Wheeler wants to know, do you have any experience with Kintsugi in your ceramic work? And if I and do. explain what Kintsugi is for those of us who don't understand. Kintsugi is a Japanese repair technique um, that is based on lacquer, lacquer. You basically glue something together and then put gold dust on it. Uh, and there's like all, it's, there's all kinds of like, hacks out there with gold epoxy and this and that but like truly it's it's its own art form in japan i have a ton of pots that i've broken over the years people have broken pots of mine and asked me to um repair them and i thought it would be a great idea for me to um learn how to do it and i was interested also i mean i think i find it really beautiful i took a class last spring uh, and did a little patch test um on my arm 
it blew up into basically my whole arm was like a big blister for months. Uh, and it got all over everything. It actually spread through my whole body because it was on, it doesn't show up for whatever, three days, five days. It was all over my clothes. Anyways, the lacquer where urushiol is the active compound in that, and it's the same thing that's in poison ivy. So I don't recommend it to everybody. Certainly not for amateurs, right? Yeah. I was really bummed though that I had that bad a reaction to it because I really would have liked to have. I mean, I guess I could take more precautions, but I it scared me off. So there are, I can, if people want to email me, there is a um, Kintsugi master in new york and there are probably uh, other people in the states um that's not cheap but it is beautiful for sure yeah i remember being in uh the studio of um uh, and home of bennett bean the potter bennett bean and he uh and he had he did that a lot the kintsugi i didn't know that was the term for it but it was beautiful mm -hmm. really beautiful. yeah and i know i've seen other potters who have done that it's, it's great yeah i mean that kind of like it's it kind of enshrines like the history of the object, right? I mean, the kind of Western equivalent is um, stapling something. Actually, there's a um, there's a blog named Past Imperfect, and uh, the guy who runs it is Andrew Baseman. And if you can find his blog, he, I mean, he has been dedicated week after year, week, year after year to posting these antique pots that have been repaired what he calls make do's uh, and they're beautiful. I mean, everything from rattan to kintsugi to stapling to whatever it is. Um, Great. Yep. So I've got one here from Suki, which might be a good one to end on. Um, she asks, uh, what do you recommend for someone who is interested in starting to use pottery to create? not just as a trade, but as a means of making change and building community and meaning through relating through trust and what, who we interact with. I think that um, ceramics has, has really, uh, like what we think of as craft is like completely, um, kind of gotten blown wide open in, in the last few years with social practice. And I think there are a lot, there are a lot of people doing um, social practice within ceramics. It makes sense. It feels like a really natural fit. And I'm blanking on, um, it, if you email me, I can send you some links um, of people that are doing like interesting social practice work. Um, Great. So Suki, you can go to the website and, and find your email through the website, right? Yep. Great. So we have three more minutes. Um, Strawberry, do we ask another question or do you, do we have closing remarks? I can't remember. Uh, I think we could do one more question before we wrap up. Okay. All right. Um, let's see, there's still a lot of them. Um, Here's another anonymous attendee uh, who asks, how do you keep building hope through the life you create? A little more abstract. I think anybody who knows me knows I'm not a total optimist. I'm probably more of a <laughs> half empty kind of uh, gal, but you know, I, I feel like it's like the only thing that we can do to keep, keep moving forward. And I think that I'm in, I'm impatient with the pace of change. And yet, even in, you know, my own lifetime, I've seen like how much, how much has changed. And so I think for me, that feels like very hopeful. And um, I think each of us like, you know, between like work, working on whatever we have to do ourselves um, and finding a, a like strong community, I feel like that is the, that is for me been the, been a gift, like the community kind of community of friends that I've been able to um, kind of foster and nurture through the work. Great. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Yumi Horie. 
thanks very much for your presence and Jorge. Thank you, work. everybody, for coming. Strawberry, can you save the chat also before we log off? Absolutely, I can. Great. Oh, socially, yeah. Paul says po socially engaged craft collective. That's that's who I was trying to think of. That's great. Yeah. So that's for Suki and anyone else, obviously, who's interested. So good. Well, thank you so much. The conversation has been great. You're terrific. Your work's terrific. I really admire you. And um, really thank you for all your great questions, Jorge.